Hi everyone, I'm Sostein. Welcome to my channel. I'm here to talk to you today about how I did a remake of the Marie Antoinette strawberry dress or the chapel dress or the church dress from the 2006 Sofia Coppola's movie Marie Antoinette. Recently, I did an interview with Cassidy of Dressed, The History of Fashion, fantastic podcast by the way, and she asked me what inspires me to make a costume or rather, how do I pick which one to make next? I explained that often I will have a dress that I want to make, but I really just can't make it because I don't have the right materials, the right fabric or the right photo, or even just like the raw like materials like the lace. The truth is we don't have all the fabrics that we want today that they would have used in the past. And frequently the fabrics we want from movies, even just from 14 years ago, are no longer available. This is particularly true for the case of this dress. By the way, if you're curious, that podcast will go live February 2nd, so do keep your eyes peeled for it. I'll link that below as well. So I had wanted to make the dress about four years back, but to be for the life of me, I could not find this exact fabric. Others, such as Maggie from Costumer's Guide, had one um, actually managed to do it by being really clever, and she actually had that fabric printed for her from Spoonflower. But I really want to have the exact fabric that they used from the film. Now, Spoonflower is printed. The original movie fabric is a silk and rayon weave, not even embroidered. It's actually woven into the fabric. I'll actually discuss this fabric more in detail next episode, but suffice to say, this fabric and the fact that, you know, I finally managed to get my hands on it, thanks in no small part to a little bit German from Instagram, who actually like told me about this fabric and thank you so much. And so because of her, I was actually able to get about 10 yards. So this dress actually pushed ahead of all the other dresses I'd wanted to make. And I started on it as soon as I got the fabric. Incidentally, this dress has some phenomenal accessories. And in some ways, the accessories are like the reason I'm obsessed with this dress. And that's what we're going to be working in today's episode. In particular, the she wears two accessories that I really want to get my hands on, which is these bright red silk mitts and this adorable pink hat. And I thought that these two would be really fun to make because they're going to be good with like any outfit, not just the strawberry dress. And the dress we'll d discuss in the next episode. But for now, let's get started with my favorite part, the mitts. This outfit is worn by Marie Antoinette for like 15 seconds while she sits in the chapel. Or is it the church? And she wears this gorgeous pink and blue strawberry gown with bright red mitts. And this, these mitts, they just like stole my heart away because they had beautiful blue embroidery. We never see a close up of the embroidery. Certainly, I could have just fudged a similar design, but why do that when there's so many beautiful historical extants that I could try to remake using the red color? Besides, as long as the mitts I make were bright red, I felt like I could capture the spirit of the mitts. And as long as the mitts were really super fancy, they would still be fit for a queen. Of course, the Guild of Glovers in England, which has the phenomenal name, the Worshipful Company of Glovers of London, has an online collection of gloves that they share to the public. This collection is honestly like fabulous. And if you ever want to fall down a really wonderful rabbit hole that just sucks several hours of your life, where you're just looking at the most beautiful gloves in existence, I highly recommend their site. They have really fantastic close-ups of a lot of it. In particular, I fell in love with this pair of mitts from 1730 in their collection. And the reason I loved it is like the incredibly detailed swirls, the flowers, the strawberry, the shading. I loved everything about it. So I emailed the guild to ask them if I could have a higher resolution image. And they referred me to Bridgman Images where I could actually license the image for my own use. Sadly, Bridgman Im Images doesn't really have something that would let me license it for YouTube, so I can't really show the digitizing process where, because that would show the image that I bought from them. But I can show you the digitized files now, and as you can see, it has a lot of like very detailed bits. So I spent a good two months of my life slowly drawing each flower and detailing how the stitches would lie, which way the stitches would go, the, the, the density, the shading, etc. And I did that all on my palette 11. I will say this particular design was a pain in the butt to digitize because of the tiny flowers and the, the embroidery gets very thick at times. Nonetheless, it was absolutely worth the effort because I really loved how this came out. 
you'll notice in the original mitts, there is a little strawberry and it's a little odd. It's got a diagonal stripe of black. And that actually is because it used to have metallic threads embroidered into it, but that's tarnished over the years. And you'll notice that the centers of the flower has this black tarnished look as well. However, on closer inspection, that has really great metallic texture. So I tried to translate this texture as much as possible into silver threads for my finished design. I did switch the strawberry to be a little bit less like theirs and a little bit more realistic and um, have shading from red to pink. And if you are very, very like into my channel, you'll notice that's very similar to the strawberries on my Regency strawberry dress. And that was done on purpose. I have every intention of re-wearing these mitts with that outfit as well. So I thought it'd be a really fun thing to make those match. So I then digitized all the different flowers, the swirls, the branches, and it was really time consuming and delicate, but really rewarding. And I honestly do enjoy digitizing. So I then did a practice stitch out on some pink set fabric I had left over and I loved it. So then I prepared that um, for the final draft. Since I'd never made mitts before, I needed a base pattern to work off and some instructions. So I bought the mitts pattern from Jess from Penny River, fantastic website. So then once I had it, I scanned in the pattern and then digitized my pattern onto her pattern to make sure that the sizing was correct. And now it was ready for stitching out. Uh, for the base silk, I went with a double face silk duchesse from New York Designer Fabrics. And that tends to embroider really well, so that's the reason I chose this one. I went with higher silk thread 50 weight, which I find to be the best for machine embroidery. I hoop my silk touche on my large 14 by 8 inch hoop with the fabric on the bias, since mitts need to be stitched on the bias, and then pinned the edges of the fabric around the hoop. So then I set up my machine, which is a baby lock venture, and stitched out. Sponsorship Steen here. While I'm embroidering this mitt, I thought I'd interrupt to take a moment to thank and discuss today's sponsor, Skillshare. Apologies for the blank wall, by the way. I kind of had a wall catastrophe. I'm waiting for my wall decal company to send me a new one, but until then, it's pretty blank. If you've watched anything by me before, you'll know that I am personally really into learning new things and I consider myself a lifelong student. In fact, I personally like to think of life as one long D&D game where I'm perpetually trying to level up my character and collect as many skill points as possible. With Skillshare is an online learning platform that has thousands of online classes that you can take in a myriad of different topics as varied from filming to storytelling to drawing to writing. And December for me was all about calligraphy and I'm already happier with my daily journaling. Right now, I'm taking a class on surface pattern design by Bonnie Christine. The classes also include a tutorial on how to use Adobe Illustrator. Now you may be like, surface pattern design, what's that? I didn't know either. Basically, Bonnie teaches you to design your own fabric and how to make it repeatable and cleaned up and how to get it printed. It's incredible and I can only imagine the ridiculous Art Nouveau fabric I will one day design and make with this awesome new skill. The funny thing is, it's something I didn't even consider as doable in the realm of possibility with the mental tools I currently had until I started the class and now my brain is just on fire with all these different ideas for fabrics I will create in the future. And that's something I really love about the Skillshare format. It's three to 10 minutes of someone teaching me something and it's so bite-sized that I actually take the time to do it. If this is something you'd be interested in, Skillshare is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership so you can explore your creativity. And now I think surely my fabric has finished embroidering. Once this was all stitched out, I took a moment to admire the embroidery. I was so proud of it. I love the way it looks with all the different colors and on the bright red, it really is just so vibrant. So then I traced the mid pattern from the paper onto the stitch out and then cut out the pieces.
the original pattern calls for you to hem all the pieces first. I actually find it easier to hem when I've ironed the hem down first. So I went ahead and did that with my um, with my iron. I just I just turned over the edges twice until it was ironed, and I used about a quarter inch for each hem. I put the ivory and the reverse red silk together, wrong sides together, and then using tiny hem stitches, I sewed down the hem as well as sewing the white to the red. I did try to make the stitches as tiny as possible so that they would not be visible on the exterior side. After hemming these as well as the thumb, I took the time to actually insert the lining. Now the original pattern by Jess does not call for lining. However, I personally find that having embroidery threads rub against your skin is kind of like rough. And especially on my arms, I didn't want something that scratchy there. So I used some pink remnants of pink linen from my Spin Spencer, the Regency Spencer I bitted. You might recognize it from that. And I pinned that down and I lined the inside. And I just kind of stitched it in by hand. Going slightly out of order, I figured out where I would want the mid to close and I cut off the excess fabric to a scant 3 8 of an inch and then machine sewed the edges, right sides together. Please note that when I did this, I did the two layers of the silk and one layer of the lining and I did that on purpose. So I stitched it with this um, seam allowance of 3 8 of an inch and then I ironed all the, the three layers underneath the free flap of lining uh, of linen lining and then turned over that edge, pinned it down and sewed it. And that way I actually hit all the margins. Then I sewed the tiny portion of the thumb together and turned it inside out. I put on the mitt, pinned it closed and then placed the thumb where I wanted it. I then turned over the edges of the silk of the thumb and then pinned it onto the body of the mitt. Then using tiny stitches, about eight stitches per inch, I slip stitched this carefully to the body. I did this with the other side as well, and there you go, one pair of bright red silk mitts. I confess, I completely love these mitts way more than I thought I would. They're just so bright and cheerful, and the colorful flowers and the strawberries just really speaks to me. With the mitts completed, let's start the hat. The hat that Marie Antoinette wears appears to be a tiny low-brimmed hat, a bergerie, covered with pale pink silk and colorful feathers. To make mine, I started with a bergerie hat that I purchased off of Etsy off of a site called Maggie May. Please note that I got the 13-inch bergerie, but they were sold out of this um, last I checked. You can easily get a slightly larger hat and then just take off excess of the straw. Even I had to take off some of the straw with my 13 inch, so it's not like the 13 inch is perfect to begin with. So uh, what I did is I actually took it off the straw until I had an 11 inch diameter hat, which is really, really easy. I just got a seam wrapper and gently cut apart some of the stitches, and then it began to unravel on its own. Once I got it to a size I liked, I sewed down the free edge and then I use my machine to stitch it down. And I would recommend using a slightly higher stitch than you would normally do. I use 4.5 millimeter stitches on mine to stitch it down because um, you don't want the, it to just rip through the straw completely. No one's gonna see any of the straw anyway because it's gonna be completely covered with silk. So don't kick yourself too much if this is like messy looking. <laughs> So then to cover this, I used instructions from my 18th century covered hat pattern by Larkin and Smith. They used to be sold on a site called At the Sign of the Golden Scissors, but the website's now defunct, so I wonder if they've gone out of business. I'm not really sure. If you know one way or the other or you're friends with them, please let me know. I'm really curious because they used to have the most incredible patterns and their patterns are still the ones I use for men's shirts and shifts. Then I used some pale pink double face silk duches I had in my stash. You may recognize this as leftovers from the bow on my Madame du Pompadour gown, but yeah, it turns out that I used up my whole budget on the fabric for this project. So the hat was pretty much made out of scraps, except for one flower, which I purchased. 
To start, I covered the crown first. I took a ruler and measured the crown diameter from one end to the other, up the top then as well. So that includes the whole distance. I added 1.5 inches to the radius or three inches to the diameter. And then I cut out the piece of silk. The plan was to tack it down at the base of the crown using back stitches. Please note that the bottom of the piece will be messy, but it will be covered again by another piece of fabric and then by bows and feathers and all that. So really don't worry too much about this part being not perfect. As I got started, I saw that the straw texture of the hat was visible through the silk, especially on the top of the crown. So I got a piece of polyester velvet I had left over from an Elsa costume I did earlier this year. By the way, the little girl loved it. And then I put that between the hat and the silk and that actually removed the texture of the straw because I wanted it to look nice and smooth on the top. And then once I was happy with that, I pinned everything into place. And again, I stitched that down with tiny little back stitches. Next, I need to shape the hat. You'll notice that Marie Antoinette's hat is also bent at the back to give it a really dramatic look. So I did the same and I tried to make it look the same as hers. So using my iron, I steamed the straw and that let me bend it without breaking it. I held it in place as the steam dried and then the hat actually kept its shape without breaking the straws and without having to do anything else. Personally, I like to do this before I cover the brim portions because then you can smooth out the fabric better than you would without that. For the brim, I trace the outside of the hat with a one inch seam allowance all around onto silk fabric with some friction pen. I cut this out and put a hole in the center. I made the hole a little bit small on purpose and gently cut little lines perpendicular to the hole until it was about the size I wanted it. Then I use an iron to iron the center circle to the exact size I wanted it. Again, if it's a little bit large or a little bit small, don't worry too much. Then I put that down wrong side to the top of the straw and then clipped the hat on all sides to hold it in place. I then use a space uh, backstitch to sew the center of the brim in place. Then I turned the hat over and for the edge, I sewed the silk onto the underside using a whip stitch, being sure to catch only the straw on the underside and not the silk on the other side. Now, please be careful to catch enough straw to actually hold it in place. I used about four to seven st stitches per inch for this region. Afterwards, I cut a piece of fabric and pinned it to the inside of the brim. Of all the regions, this just needs to be loosely pinned in because the goal is just to cover the inside of the hat so that it doesn't accidentally grab your hair when you put it on. I cut a circle of fabric the same as the brim and then ironed the seam allowance around the edge. Then I cut the hole in the, in the center, ironed that seam allowance as well, and then pinned it to the underside of the hat. Now, uh, please note that the goal is to have an exterior of the hat that is completely clean. So then I use tiny little stitches to catch the edge of the silk of the exterior brim and only that to kind of keep the silk in place. And you'll notice you have a hat that is fully covered. Now, if you look at the hat on Marie Antoinette in the movie, you'll notice there's some pleats on the top of the brim. I did make these pleats and for that I used the vinegar water method. Uh, Costuming Drama goes about it, goes into it in one of her videos. So I used that method and I pinned it onto the hat only to realize that I hated the pleats in it. Like I just didn't like it. And I think it's pro probably because of the material I use. I used a very thick silk douche and the original is probably done with um, with silk taffeta, which is much thinner and probably the pleats wouldn't have been so dramatic. Nonetheless, this is what I had. So I just removed it and I honestly like the hat without the pleats better anyway, so that worked, worked really nicely. Now the hat is ready for decorating. The original hat looks like it has some silk organza trim and then some colorful feathers as well as some flowers. Her feathers are blue and since the blue in my gown has been switched out for green, I'll go into it next episode, I thought it would be nice to have some green feathers. 
Unfortunately, I could not find a shade of green on anywhere that I liked on feathers. So luckily I did have some beautiful white ostrich feathers in the house already. And as I said, I really didn't have a very large budget for this hat. I liked the look of these feathers, so I used those. To start, I got some three inch wide silk organza torn and distressed on the edges just to match the organza from the gown. And then I poofed this. To poof the organza, I put in a row of gathering stitches every three inches. I then gathered each row and tied it off, knotting it securely. Then I cut off the remainders of the thread, and I did that for every single poof. It actually wasn't as many as you'd think. Then I pinned these poofs onto the hat, tucking each row of gathers underneath the poof of the lot, previous poof, if that makes sense. And then I went all the way around, pinning this down. I made sure to cover any parts of the hat that I thought looked kind of ugly. As I said, this is what it's for. And then I put the starting and ending ends of the poofs under where the feathers would go since that would fully cover all of it. After that, I got two ostrich feathers and put them where I wanted them to go. I, I really just did that this by playing with it and seeing how I liked the way it looked. I ended up having the tips of the feathers towards the back and the front of the feathers towards the front, like facing the anterior of the head. So then I cut the ostrich feathers. Please note that these ostrich feathers were like 17 inches, so I had to cut off quite a bit. And it was kind of heartbreaking to cut them because it's so against everything you think about to cut ostrich feathers. But really, uh, too big is just as ugly as too small, so I did, I did it. And then I got some upholstery thread and I sewed the feathers down. Now it was time to add the flowers. Her hat has some bright red flowers and it kind of matches the red of the gloves. And I love this idea. I'm rather partial to poppies. Not only are they such a vibrant red, I love the historical tidbit about them that they were in fact used to make morphine in the past. And morphine was one of the few actual painkillers that worked in the late Georgian era. Albeit, we're talking really late Georgian. I believe George, um, morphine was first marketed as a painkiller in 1817, and this hat is supposedly from 1780s. So it's a fun medical fact, and it's not quite in time, but at the same time, it's like a really cool science fact, and I'm a total nerd, so let's go with that. So I got a synthetic version of it on Amazon. I actually ordered a beautiful like silk version from Europe, and it got lost in the mail. I still don't have it. It was supposed to be here three weeks ago, but you know, it's the mail, what can I do? But these Amazon ones are perfectly lovely. Then I used some white dogwoods I had lying around the house, as well as these tiny paper pink flowers. And you might recognize it from my Madame du Pompadour gown. You know, it's all ties together, especially since like, as I said, this is like a leftover hat. And I glued all of that down using E6000 glue because that is the best craft glue ever. For the long rows of ribbons down the back, I chose a very pale ivory. I pinked the edges using some pinking shears and then sewed it on the back of a hat. And there you go, a Marie Antoinette hat. I had to, of course, try the hat on to see if it gave me the desired effect. So if you look at the movie, I think she has two different hairs, one for when she is actually in the church wearing the hat, and then she actually has her hair up higher when she's at the breakfast with the king after. I chose to do the lower hair because her hair is just way, like three inches higher for the next scene and her hat should be three inches higher as well and it's not. For me, I did a, um, I just did a simple bun in the back and then I got some extra hair pieces and I braided that and I pinned it around my head around the same place where I see Kristen Dunst, Dunst's hair braided as well. And then I got an antique hat pin and then I used that hat pin to pin it in place. And you'll notice that I'm wearing it with a different gown. This pink gown is one that I actually made last year for a ball in Venice. I call it my Marie Antoinette gown, and it has a really cool tidbit about it. So the ball was in Venice. It's It was fantastic, but the theme of the ball was the favorites, or rather the royal favorites, hinting that you're supposed to dress up as a royal mistress of some sort. I told my husband I didn't want to go as a mistress. I wanted him to go as a mistress. So I made him um, Count Furson and I made myself Marie Antoinette. Now the really amazing thing about Count Furson is that his court suit still exists in a museum in Sweden. And I thought that was so cool. So I actually uh, digitized that court suit. 
using some pictures I could get online and I made a version of that for him. I took the trim from that court suit and I used that to trim my dress. So I call it my Marie Antoinette dress because this dress has a little nod to Count Furson. And it's just a little cheeky thing that I did. Again, there's no proof that they were lovers. There's no proof that they weren't, but they were in fact very respectful and they clearly cared a lot about each other. So cool tidbit. So I'm wearing this pink dress and on top of that, I am of course putting on this hat and I'm putting on the mitts. And as you can see, it goes so well. These mitts go with everything. And there you go, the accessories for my Marie Antoinette gown. Honestly, sometimes the accessories are like more fun than the actual dress. In this case, the dress is also amazing and I can't wait to show you next week. So if you have a chance, I highly recommend checking out Jess's store, Penny River on Etsy uh, when she reopens. I think she's currently closed this week, but these instructions are super easy. They go together really well and I highly recommend them. They won't be embroidered like mine, but you know, they are still gonna be gorgeous. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Next time I'll be putting together the dress itself.